All right, at these difficult times, we are very mindful of our guests' time. So even though people are continuing to come into the briefing, we'll get started. Uh, these are very difficult times indeed. And I'd like to welcome everybody to today's ZOA emergency briefing featuring Israel MK Daniel Luz. It's been <clears throat> 11 painful days since Hamas Arab terrorists invaded Israel in a series of orchestrated savage and barbaric attacks, the likes of which we have never seen. It is impossible to bear the images we've all seen showing the depravity of the attacks on children, the elderly women and men, but watch them we must, we're at war and we must understand the savagery of our enemies. As we have from our formation in 1897, ZOA stands resolutely with Israel, completely supporting Israel's right, even obligation to defend herself. And we encourage the Israeli leadership to use the full force of their military to pursue justice, which must include the complete eradication of Hamas. ZOA Director of Special Projects Liz Burney conducted last night the second ZOA Coalition Emergency Activism Committee <laughs> meeting. If you'd like to join the next meeting, watch for an email, go to our website, www.zoa.org, or call our office to register for the next meeting. We promise to bring regular briefings as the war unfolds. We have two more briefings in the pipeline, one tomorrow at 1 p.m. when we will get a report from Gaza, from Amot Seal, the CEO and founder of Taz Peep, Israel's first and only syndicated news service. And on Monday, we'll be joined by Rabbi Fendel, the Rosh Yeshiva of the Chesda Yeshiva, who bore witness to the carnage in Sderot. Uh, my colleague, Jackie, will put um, registration links in the chat during this briefing. Please put questions for MK Aluz in the Q&A section of our Zoom screen. And with no further ado, I'd like to ask ZOA National President Mort Klein to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I ask for a moment of silence in memory of the almost 2,000 innocent Jewish people who were tortured and massacred and murdered for the sole reason of their being Jews and for the 200 to 250 hostages uh, who are now in a terrible situation in Gaza, having been kidnapped by monsters from the Muslim Arab terrorist group Hamas. And today we learn that Mahmoud Abbas's Fatah Palestinian Authority uh, people as well were involved in these atrocities. <laughs> A moment of silence. Thank you very much. May Hashem intervene and help the Jewish people and the Jewish state of Israel. <laughs> I'm deeply appreciative of uh, having a distinguished guest with us, the member of Knesset, Dana Luz. Dana Luz is a native of Canada, a graduate of McGill University Law School, was a member of the City Council of Jerusalem, was an advisor to a number of uh, political leaders in Israel, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And I'm most proud that he was the Zionist Organization of America, ZOA's representative in Jerusalem uh, for a number of years and did a fabulous job. He's now a member of Knesset and we are grateful him taking time out to update us on the situation in Eretz Yisrael. MK Dana Luz. Thank you, Mort. Uh, thank you. Uh, everyone for being here. I see there's a, a big showing uh, and I'm grateful of that. Uh, I uh, want to um, start, first of all, by thanking all of you for the support uh, in the last 11 days. Uh, I can tell you that Israel uh, feels this support. Not only I do personally, but the people of Israel uh, have felt the support uh, of the Jewish people. Uh, in the last 10 days, uh, Israel, which if you remember <laughs> around three weeks ago, was incredibly united, has become probably the most united nation 
uh, that exists in the world. The Jewish people, including the diaspora, have become incredibly united. And I think that also the Western world uh, has united uh, behind Israel. And the reason for all of these things uh, is unfortunate, of course, but it's uh, also because the t terror and the evil that we saw 11 days ago is something which was never seen before in Israel. And actually, it's to an extent, if you look at things proportionally to the population, then it's probably the worst <coughs> terrorist attack uh, that humanity has known, definitely in modern history. Because the uh, 1,400 people now that have been declared uh, dead uh, in the terrorist attack would account to, if I'm correct, something like around 40,000 people uh, being killed in a terrorist attack uh, in, uh, in the United States. Now, it's not just the number of people that were killed that is horrendous. And maybe I would say it's not even what is most horrendous. What is most horrendous is the way they were killed. We're talking about babies being burnt alive, women raped and then killed. We're talking about elderly kidnapped when their medication is far away from them. We know what that means. We're talking about rockets being sent as we speak. By the way, I wasn't sure if I should tell Alan and Mort uh, before that usually at 8 p.m. there's a siren. Uh, it sometimes happens also in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem tonight, it didn't happen in Jerusalem. I'm not sure if it happened in the rest of Israel. But rockets are still being thrown as we're speaking. And we have to realize, yes, we have the Iron Dome. And so we have technology that stops these rockets. But when Hamas terrorists send these rockets, their goal is to kill more civilians. They hope that each one of these rockets kills 10, 20, 100 people. So yes, we build defense systems, but their intention uh, is to kill as many civilians up until today uh, as possible uh, with these rockets uh, indiscriminately. Now, all of these things have removed the mask uh, from Hamas. And we now understand something that, to be honest, I know that I understood. I know that Mort has been saying it for a long time, has been saying it for a long time, that there is no difference between, you know, and before I say the sentence I wanted to say, and I will say it, but I want to I want to emphasize that in Israel, we're incredibly careful comparing anything with Nazi Germany, because we want to be sure that the extent of evil that there was in the Holocaust is not diminished. But in the past few days, everyone in Israel understands and says that what we've seen is an evil regime that is exactly in its intentions like the regime of Nazi Germany. And the only difference between them, the only difference is that Nazi Germany had more of an ability to implement its horrible, evil, bloodthirsty uh, vision, while the Hamas is just less powerful. And if we let it be powerful, then we'll do exactly what it wants to do, and it's to try and eradicate the Jews from this planet. Now, having understood that, and thank God, again, I don't want to thank God for this tragedy because I'm definitely not, but I am happy that we finally are awake. Uh, having understood that, we now understand that there's no other choice but to eradicate the regime of Hamas. This is something that the right and the left understand. This is something that everyone is now on par with. The regime of Hamas needs to be eradicated. Every Hamas terrorist that there is in Gaza has to be killed. And after the war is over, Israel cannot have a threat coming out of Hamas, which means there cannot be any military entity that can threaten Israel that exists in Gaza. 
those are the basic things that have become common agreement uh, between everyone that exists in Israel. And again, I must say, I'm not trying to tooth your horn, uh, Mort, but I know that those are things that you've been uh, preaching for for a long time. But now they're basically very much agreed upon all around Israel. And we're entering this military operation with these goals in mind, including an additional goal, which is to rescue uh, the hostages, which are b currently uh, being taken hostage by Hamas in a way, of course, that's completely against every single interpretation uh, of international law. A lot of Israeli supporters and a lot of Israelis uh, are impatient uh, because they ask, uh, what's going on? 11 days have passed. All we see is uh, airstrikes. So first of all, I do want to say the airstrikes are very strong. Uh, they're very uh, they're very significant. They're much more significant than everything that has been in the past. Uh, and, uh, and that has to be said. Uh, however... Just so you know, there's been more airstrikes in the past week uh, on Gaza than there was in a, in a year uh, in Afghanistan. So it's 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 by America, of course. So it's significant. However, this is only the start. And anyone who thinks that this is uh, the operation, uh, then that's that's not the case at all. Uh, Israel is taking its time. We're taking our time for a, a few reasons. First of all, because we need to acquire enough intelligence which is fact-checked. To be honest, we were surprised. We were taken by surprise by Hamas. And so we need to uh, recheck our intelligence. Uh, we, of course, arrested some of the terrorists that did what they did in the South. And so we have the ability to recheck our intelligence, uh, make sure that uh, our intelligence sources are correct. And so this is something that takes time, uh, and we will take our time to do that. And the second thing is that every bomb that we send right now from the air uh, is uh, preparing the ground for Israel, Israel's ground troops afterwards to do what they have to do uh, with less danger. We're a strong country. If in the past we were a, a small country uh, defending ourselves against big armies and we were seen as the underdog, uh, thank God today where we have a big army. And when you're the underdog, then you want to try and get quick wins, uh, get the, the, the operation uh, ended as quickly as possible in six days, in two weeks, in three weeks. The Yom Kippur War, when it comes to the fighting, was actually a, considered a long war for Israel. and was only three weeks of fighting. It was longer well, until there was a, an actual agreement of a ceasefire, but the actual fighting was around three weeks. That was considered a long war. This one will be much longer will be much longer because the, the fighting is difficult, but it will be in the streets of Gaza, which aren't an ideal territory to have fighting for in. But it will be also longer because we're a strong army and we'll take our time and we're in no rush. We'll do the job well. We'll do it thoroughly, uh, but we'll do it without endangering any more soldiers that need to be endangered. Of course, in every war, there are casualties. And we unfortunately expect that also in this war. Uh, but we we will do the things well, slowly, thoroughly, the way the way they need uh, to be done. I will add uh, that international support for Israel has been very positive. Uh, American support for Israel has been tremendous across party lines. Uh, it was a bipartisan support. And I'm not talking about the minority of a certain party that we all know, that small minority, the squad uh, that is making uh, that, those disgracious comments and supporting uh, terrorists. Uh, I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about mainstream America. Uh, they've been uh, incredibly supportive on both sides of the aisle. We're grateful for that. It's true also of Europe uh, in a way that hasn't been seen before. I will say, however, that there is a worry in Israel that it is easy to support Israel when it's being attacked. The question is, will the support stay uh, when we're defending ourselves? And we will defend ourselves. We'll defend ourselves forcefully uh, and we will eradicate Hamas. Will the support stand? I'll tell you two things. First of all, I really hope so, because this fight 
isn't just about Israel. It's about Western civilization. It's about the free world. This terrorist attack happens and Hamas survives it. It's a message to terrorists all around the world that they can do these things against Jews or against Christians or against Muslims or against any other people and that they can survive these and that the world will feel okay with it. So I, I hope that they realize that it's not just about the Jews. It's about the free world and so that they will stand by us. But I want to also say that even if they do not stand by us, the morale right now in Israel is that we will do what is needed, whatever the cost. Uh, we, we've we been woken up uh, in a way that, unfortunately, sometimes it takes a tragedy to wake up a, a nation. So we've been woken up. And whatever uh, international pressure is put on us will just be seen as support for those terrorists uh, that did what they did. And we won't bow down to that international pressure. Uh, we will do what needs to be done. Um, now, after saying these things, I do want to say one more uh, thing before opening up to questions. And that's uh, the big question about Hezbollah and uh, Iran. Uh, those are two questions. Hezbollah is on, our, the, on the Lebanon border. <laughs> Uh, already firing rockets on Israel. Uh, Iran is obviously sponsoring Hamas. There's fingerprints of Iran all over uh, the attack uh, that happened on the, the 7th of October. And the question is, will they also get involved in this uh, fight? Uh, I don't know what the, what the answer is. I know that the American president has been very clear uh, in asking and demanding that they don't. I'm not sure they really listen to the American president, but maybe they they listen to American force. And therefore, also the uh, aircraft carriers have been sent to the region to give a clear, clear message. Uh, but I want to say two things again. The first thing is that if they get involved, Israel is strong enough to defeat them and to make them pay a heavy price, the same way we will make uh, pay, uh, Hamas pay a heavy price. The same way that Hamas is eradicated, if Hezbollah dares to get into this conflict, it will also get eradicated. And if Iran dares to get into this conflict, it will regret the day that it got into this conflict. I can promise you that. We have a very strong army. It looks as if uh, uh, questions marks are put on our strength. There's no question mark. We're a strong army. We were taken by surprise. There's no use in denying that. We were taken by surprise, but we won't be surprised anymore. We're very alert right now, and then our army is incredibly powerful, and it can defend ourselves on these three fronts, including also the front of Judea and Samaria and the Israeli Arabs, which are fronts that are relatively quiet right now. Not fully quiet, but relatively quiet. But if there's a need, uh, then also on those fronts, uh, we're, we're willing and ready to be at all fronts at the same time. We prefer not to. We prefer to deal with one enemy at a time, but we're ready uh, on all of these fronts. After I said that, I also want to say the ideology of Hamas and of Iran is exactly the same ideology, a uh, uh, sub area of Hezbollah and of Iran is exactly the same ideology as Hamas. We shouldn't fool ourselves. They, if they have the opportunity to do what Hamas did, they'll do it again. They not only support uh, what Hamas did. They, 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 I, I sometimes feel from some of the statements of Hezbollah that they're actually jealous that Hamas did it and not them. They have the same ideology. We shouldn't fool ourselves. And therefore, the eradication of Hamas right now is important not only because of Hamas, but because we need our force, the force that we use right now to ring strongly also in the streets of Lebanon and in the streets of Tehran, for them to understand that you don't mess with the Jewish state. You don't mess with Israel. And if you do, you're simply eradicated. You stop existing, nothing else. There's no other option. If you do what Hamas does, you stop existing, period. Uh, and so that's the message that we also have to send the whole world, specifically Hezbollah and Iran, in our operation uh, within Gaza, 
uh, and that's what we plan to do. That's what we'll go, we're going to do. Uh, I think I, that that's uh, the end of my opening statement for the briefing, and I'd be happy to open up for questions and answers. <clears throat> Mort, do you have the first question? <clears throat> Thank you, MK. Uh, Iluz, you really touched on many, many important areas. I appreciate your thoroughness. I wanted to ask, we keep getting missiles, Israel does, from Gaza. Why aren't we going and destroying the rocket launchers? Is it because they're underneath schools and mosques? It is the duty of Israel to protect Israeli civilians, not Arab civilians. So my question is, you know, why are there still missiles being launched? Can we destroy the rocket launchers wherever they are? And secondly, please let us know if Fatah, Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian Authority, are there people in any way, shape, or form involved in the murders and the kidnappings? Thank you very much. So I'll start with the first question and then go to the second one. Uh, the first question was about the rocket launchers and why we still have rockets. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, the The real problem is not about mosques and schools. We've we've attacked mosques uh, this time around. Uh, I don't know about schools to be honest, but we we've attacked mosques uh, that were used as a stacking house of uh, missiles. Uh, I, I think on that point also, Israel woke up. Uh, I, I agree with you that in the past, uh, with the subtext of what you said, uh, that in the past, Israel has uh, shown greater care for uh, Palestinian civilians than needs to, according to international law even. I'm for international law, uh, but uh, we shouldn't do more than what is required by law. Definitely not when we're against such a vicious enemy. And international law allows for a country to defend itself forcefully. If not, then no one would follow international law. Uh, and so obviously, uh, if there are weapons stocked in a mosque, I'm telling you as a person who studied law and specialized in international law and was a, uh, and was a legal advisor to the army uh, before uh, I was a member of Knesset for my reserve service. Uh, and so I can tell you, I know international law well and international law well. If there's weapons stocked in the mosque, international law allows you to attack that mosque, 100 percent. It might not look good in the media, but I care more about uh, Jews surviving than them looking good in the media. And so uh, that, that but but again, that's the realization has happened. And that's not that's not what's happening right now. The problem is that over the years, uh, Hamas has uh, built an underground system. Uh, that we call in intelligence circles here in Israel, the Metro. Uh, it's a very vast system which goes throughout Gaza. By the way, that's that's the part that will be more difficult uh, to take care of when we go in with ground troops. Uh, we know about it, uh, but a lot of the weapons are stacked there underground in bunkers, and they just go out when they use them. Uh, and so it will take time. It will, it, there will probably be rockets launched uh, all the way until the ground invasion at least starts, uh, and it might be even after it's uh, it's going in, because we need to get to these underground bunkers uh, and take care of business there. That's about the first question. About the second question, I'll be honest, I did not see any evidence of Fatah involvement, but I heard your opening statements. If you do have some evidence as such, then I'd love for us to have a conversation afterwards uh, in order to talk about it. I will say that I am. I think it's a disgrace that Fatah which is uh, Mahmoud Abbas, right? Which is seen by the world as moderate and even touted as the, the potential solution for this problem uh, took days to even condemn. And he didn't really condemn it. He was pressured into saying that it wasn't good. Uh, the Hamas massacre, you see a massacre, uh, you should condemn it right away. Uh, if not, then that means that you don't have, really have a problem with that ideology. And it took him days to, again, it wasn't even a condemnation. He was pushed to the wall in order to say that he doesn't identify with it. And it would, took a ton of American pressure for that to happen. It's a disgrace. It was obviously not genuine. Uh, and so I do not see in any way Fatah as being the solution. And they're part of the problem. They up until today pay salaries to the families of terrorists. They up until today name schools and their streets and roads. Uh, in the name of terrorist martyrs, they see them as martyrs. Uh, and so uh, 
they're in no way a potential partner. They're part of the problem, not part of the solution. Thank you. Um, Mort, do you have another question? No, let, let's go to other questions that people have. Okay, and we're going to be a little bit respectful, Dan, of your time. I see that it's running late. There's one question that's going to weigh heavily in our minds. The implications about the visit just recently by the president are great. You know, re replenishment of arms, alignment with our enemies. Uh, is it too early? And can you share with us what we learned today from President Biden's visit? And because the, the questions are going to run, we're going to run over time. Um, if you can also address uh, the statements made by the Saudi Arabians, which you didn't touch on, what are your feelings about that? Uh, and I think we'll leave it at that. So the about the American uh, support, I said in my comments that we're very grateful for American support. Biden was here uh, today. Uh, he made an incredible speech, to be honest, a very, very pro-Israel. Uh, there are some disagreements in the margins, mostly with respect to humanitarian aid. Uh, we disagree. We believe that there should be absolutely no humanitarian aid uh, up until the hostages are released, at the very least. Uh, that, that's the very minimum. Uh, Biden believes otherwise. Uh, he believes that uh, civilians shouldn't pay the price for their leadership. Uh, there is some middle ground that has been agreed. I mean, it's already been published, so I can share it with you guys. Uh, that the Israel will not actively in any way help humanitarily uh, until the hostages are secured, but it won't uh, stop Egypt from giving specifically food, water, and medication, that's it, only these three things, uh, to the Gaza Strip, uh, after obviously uh, being checked uh, by the Israeli army. So this is the middle ground in order to also show some type of uh, thank you uh, to America uh, and not just uh, stick to our guns in that disagreement. But again, it's it's uh, it's a disagreement. Uh, but uh, I want to I want to say that overall the visit was very positive, and in Israel it's seen as uh, as something which is which is very significant both strategically uh, and also uh, with respect to uh, the way we feel about America. To be honest, uh, it shows that America stepped up to the plate. And strategically, it shows our enemies that if they uh, they uh, attack us, uh, then that uh, will have repercussions on them. Also, I will say that the main uh, important practical thing that came out of there is a clear statement by Biden that he will get Congress to approve an unprecedented uh, bill uh, for military support of Israel uh, financially and weapons wise. Uh, that will be presented to Congress in the days to come. Uh, and also that he made it clear that he understands that this is an, a, a different type of war and that he will not pressure uh, a clock on Israel. He understands that this will take time uh, and he doesn't have a clock on Israel. And so he's giving us the time to uh, do what needs to be done. Again, he's giving, we're an independent country, right? I believe that we shouldn't ask for permission to do what needs to be done, but it is helpful when a superpower is standing by us uh, and not asking us in any way uh, to uh, limit the amount of time that it will take us to do what needs to be done. Uh, so that's a little bit about Biden's visit. When it comes to Saudi Arabia, I'm a strong believer of the Abraham Accords. And I can tell you, by the way, you asked about Saudi Arabia, but I can tell you that I... I am the, the head of the Abraham Accords Caucus in, in the Knesset, and I'm in, uh, in touch with people in Morocco, in the Emirates, in Bahrain. On the day of the attack and the days following it, I got messages from very high level uh, people in the Emirates, which I'm not going to name because uh, th these were private conversations, but they told me very clearly that they're on our side, that they mourn for us, and that they hope that we eradicate Hamas. Those are their words, not something. And so it's clear that in the Emirates, they see uh, eye to eye with us, whether they say it publicly uh, or not. I think that what's going on in uh, in Saudi Arabia is similar, uh, although I have to be, uh, to be frank and to say that this is my own interpretation. I'm not privy to inside information there. But I think that Saudi Arabia is... Uh, 
the, first of all, they didn't sign yet a peace agreement with uh, Israel, and so I think that right now they're uh, they're uh, more interested in uh, in appeasing the crowds within their country, which aren't necessarily pro Israel. They're more pro Hamas, and so they're using harsh language. But when push comes to shove, uh, Saudi Arabia's interest is for us to destroy Hamas. Saudi Arabia is threatened by the Muslim Brotherhood more than we are, probably, uh, or at least as much as we are. Uh, and so all of the Arab countries that want to move forward and not go backwards to the uh, Middle Ages, to the Dark Ages, uh, have a vested interest for us to completely defeat and eradicate Hamas. Uh, and so I think we need to understand that there's a difference between what is being said to their crowds uh, in order to appease them because they have their own internal politics and for what they actually want as a regime. If you ask me, the worst thing that could happen to the potential of peace and normal normalization with Saudi Arabia is for Israel not to eradicate Hamas because then they'll see us as weak. They'll see us as a less interesting partner. And actually, if we do the job and eradicate Hamas, then there's a higher chance that the process that started beforehand will continue to move forward because they'll see us as a strong ally that knows how to deal with extremist Islamists and also with uh, Iranian proxies. And they obviously see both of these things as threats. Uh, and so that, that will only strengthen the connection between Israel and, and uh, Saudi Arabia. Thank you so much, MK Aluz. We promised to the MK that we would let him go at half past the hour. I'd like to ask uh, ZOA Chief Development Officer Lee Rosenbaum to thank Dan formally. You're muted, Lee. Sorry about that. Dan, thank you so much for what you do for Israel and the Jewish people. I want to let everybody know that yesterday, Newsmax named the five best charities to support during this terrible time. And ZOA is honored to be one of those charities. And why? Because while the IDF protects its citizens by land and sea and air, the ZOA, since its inception, has protected Jewish citizens in the halls of justice courts across the country, on campuses across the country, and of course, on Capitol Hill. Now is the time to support the ZOA. We can do a lot. But with more, we can do more. Thank you very much.